I love sugars and fats. I love them. I do. And I know that you all do too. And the reason for that is not because I'm a mind reader or even because I see a few of them in the front row drooling over my Ben and Jerry's. I know this because I'm an evolutionary biologist. And so your love for fats and sugars is the same as mine because, well, it's the same as our ancestors. And it's this love, these cravings for fats and sugars that allowed our ancestors to survive those long, cold winter nights, rewarding them with a few extra pounds to get through the lean months, and the same perceived deliciousness that um, at least I get to experience right now. So, breakfast of champions, excuse me. Of course, our environment has changed a little bit since back in those days. McDonald's then wasn't around every corner, and well, Ben and Jerry, they were the guys that lived in the cave next door, and their main flavor was antelope. <laughs> so despite the significant changes right, to our accessibility in fats and sugars, and probably our needs for fats and sugars, this hasn't stopped a ghost from our evolutionary past from haunting our taste buds, convincing us that we still require these flavors. And I'd argue that this really isn't the only evolutionary ghost that's currently wrecking havoc on society. Never in my lifetime have I seen our country or our world as divided as it is today. There are battle cries against Muslims, homosexuals, immigrants. Even you know, as we cry for Brussels and Paris, there's atrocities committed in Chad, Nigeria. Wars are waging ever onward in Afghanistan and Syria. And I'm, I'm not trying to leave anybody off the list. It's just the list has been so long. How did we ever become so divided? This is the ghost of our present haunting. It's our divisiveness that, I'd argue, is, shares roots with our sweet tooth. A ghost of an evolutionary past, one in which you could really only trust those that sat around the campfire with you at night, because the others, those outside people, well, they could come in and steal my resources. And without my sweet Ben and Jerry's, I might not make it through the winter. This was a matter of life and death. And so the fear of the other, those outsiders, that was an adaptation for survival. And it's just as tangible and ever powerfully present today as our sweet tooth. OK, so I've talked about our accessibility to fats and sugars changing. It's not the only thing that's changed in our modern environment, right? We're more connected than we've ever been. So we're no longer bound by the physical constraints of our ancestors, nor many of their same threats to survival. It is highly unlikely that you are going to die if somebody doesn't like your Facebook status. Right? But even if that one friend doesn't, it's OK, because the average Facebook user has over 330 other friends. We send 500 million tweets every single day. And even in the non-virtual world, we're connected by over 100,000 flights globally daily. OK, so where does this leave our Stone Age brains in this modern connected environment? It basically leaves them on information overload going tilt, right? What worked in the past, what worked in our evolutionary past, has led to this grossly inappropriate reliance on social categorization, just to make sense of the world around us. So let me put this a slightly different way. This is your brain. Highly adapted, right? Really well, I guess, really great at identifying people, places, objects in an environment where your individuals that you hung out with hovered around 20 or so. This is your brain on 7 billion people, constantly betraying you by overextending the same strategies that worked so well in our evolutionary past. It's rare today that a single individual can be representative of an entire group of people. And yet, our brains so doggedly persist in identifying people into groups of us and them. Us. Them. Us, them, us, them. I often envision, like many cinematics before me, a truly outside other, some alien species coming in and threatening the survival of the human species. I can't imagine a more rapid or better way for us to truly unite as one collective force, humans versus aliens. Right, but barring some massive alien invasion, what hope is there for us to unite? I think there is hope, and I think that hope comes in the form of kale. 
Bear with me on this. Bear with me on this. So, 10 years ago, you all had not heard of kale. Trust me, even if you're some weird vegetarian hippie, and I can talk about you like that because you're one of my in-group, okay? You hadn't heard of kale. It's a weird, bitter vegetable. Nobody really likes it. Until it was repositioned as kale chips. <laughs> oh, chips. I can get down with some chips. Deep fried, salted. Mmm, I love chips. So suddenly you start to see kale in its less processed form in grocery stores and in smoothie bars. And before you knew it, you couldn't turn around without seeing kale. It was everywhere. It had become a part of us, a part of our culture. We embraced it. This is what we need to do with people. We need to take the others, the outsiders, the weird ones, and make them a little more like us, a little more familiar, like we did kale. So I invite you to participate with me, just quickly, in a little experiment. I want you to think of some outsider, some individual that's different from you, not in your in-group. Now, we're going to make them a little more familiar. Do not coat them in oil and salt like kale. That's weird. <laughs> that's weird. Imagine instead, Picture them as a mother or a father, or a child. If you happen to be religious, imagine this other person as a practicer of a religion. It may not be the same religion as yours, but still somebody who recognizes a higher power and worships and respects them. If that doesn't work for you, do what I do, and just imagine the other as another lover of Ben and Jerry's. Our modern environment hasn't left us completely ill-equipped for coping with these evolutionary ghosts. In fact, the media that we stream into our homes daily provides a powerful opportunity for us to redefine and reposition those others as a bit more familiar. This could be, as a matter of fact, an opportunity for us to see this as the ghost of our evolutionary future, something that helps us predict new cultural norms, expands our in-groups. Let me give you an example. I, I have a dear friend of mine who's very active in the Bosnian refugee crisis, and she's been back and forth to Bosnia for a number of years. When she first came back from her first trip, we were having a discussion about the culture of homosexuality in Bosnia. I can sum it up really quick, right? Gay was not okay. Not something we talked about. Okay, they were the other, they were shunned, they were ostracized. Not, they were the outgroup. She recently returned from a, another trip, and she had a very different story to tell. Suddenly, gay was the coolest thing you could be. You, could, you couldn't get any cooler than to have a gay best friend. Okay, wait, so I'm confused. How did an entire culture, an entire country, shift so rapidly on such a radical idea? Turns out that they'd been showing reruns of Will and Grace in Bosnia for the past five years. Judging by the laughter, I'm assuming you all remember that Will and Grace is a sitcom about a gay man, Will, living with his friend Grace. Incredible. So recently, a slightly more scientific approach to this same phenomenon was conducted by a graduate student by the name of Sahard Mahar. Okay, so she took a group of participants, and she split them, and one half of the group watched Little Mosque on the Prairie. It's a real thing, okay? It's a Canadian sitcom about a Muslim family living in small-town Canada, maybe experiencing a few culture clashes, as you might imagine. The other group was assigned to watch reruns of Friends. An American sitcom having little, let's be honest, nothing to do with Muslim culture or identity. Okay, so the remarkable bit of this study is that even six weeks after the final episode of these, these two sitcoms had been watched, participants were tested, and the group that had been assigned to watch Little Mosque on the Prairie showed a significant reduction in their anti-Muslim biases, whereas those that had watched Friends showed no difference in their prejudices. We're living at a critical tipping point in our evolutionary history, one in which we must face the consequences of blindly following our evolutionary ghosts. We know that doing this, well, it's not good for us. Right? These habits aren't good for us. We should have outgrown, in the, we definitely should have outgrown our needs for fats and sugars, or our cravings for fats and sugars in an accessible world like this. And to the same effect, we should have outgrown our outgroups. There's no room for outgroups in our modern connected society, save perhaps one. And we need to make sure that that outgroup is comprised of individuals that despise things diverse. A monoculture of hate cannot grow. It will wither away and die, overrun and outcompeted by the cooperative and diverse in-groups that surround it. So it's our responsibility not to feed this monoculture with fear, 
but rather to fertilize it with hope and familiarity and feed that kaleidoscope of our ever-expanding in-group. It's time that we give up the ghosts and maybe eat a little kale along the way. Thank you so much. Thank you.